Everything we do, we want to be strategic. Because the goal here is ultimately its impact. It's changing the situation on the ground. Our in-depth investigations, our documentation, and our advocacy has allowed us to influence policymakers to ensure that civilians are better protected and to ensure that those who are responsible for crimes and conflicts across the world are brought to justice. Now, 13 and a half hours after Hamas launched its audacious assault, Israel says it's at war and Palestinians are already paying a heavy price. There is nowhere else, no other country, no other conflict in the world in modern time where that percentage of children, that percentage of women, that percentage of doctors, humanitarian workers, journalists, has been killed. Nowhere else it even remotely close to. We're trying to be very strategic in how we choose what to investigate, because we know that the bigger picture story that needs to be told here is of the risk of genocide. could provide the photographs of the fragment with the serial numbers of the munitions, the name and the photographs of the victims, the GPS coordinates of the houses, the satellite imagery that shows that the houses were destroyed. It's been widely received within U.S. Congress. You have seen senators who have publicly referenced it in, in letters calling on the Biden administration to, to stop providing support that is being used in, in likely war crimes. And we know, given the influence that the U.S. has, that trying to change the narrative in the U.S. is essential to ultimately reducing the harm that's being done, the devastation that's being wrought against civilians throughout Gaza. When we saw South Africa's submission to the International Court of Justice, so much of our documentation went into that. And so we know that what we're doing is providing a, an incredibly important record that make it very, very difficult for anyone to dismiss. Tonight, Sudan descending into violence. We often say that impunity fuels further conflict, and this is an absolute, concrete, devastating example. In 2003, inter-ethnic violence was brutally crushed by the government-backed Janjaweed Arab militia, leaving 300,000 civilians dead. There has been no accountability for all of those violations that has taken place. Victims say they still see their oppressors walking the streets. That is why we have the conflict again in Sudan. The human rights group Amnesty International says that war crimes have become widespread in Sudan. That evidence enabled us to convince members of the international community to create a mechanism to preserve the evidence with a view to holding the perpetrators to account. The Evidence Lab is a digital investigations team. We work through layers and layers and layers of evidence to provide really an irrefutable account of events. Since the removal of an office and arrest of the former president, Pedro Castillo, thousands of people took the streets to protest. The authorities respond with the use of lethal force to silence demonstrations. 
Amnesty International says at least 48 people died by state repression and 80% were killed in indigenous populated areas. All the collaboration with the evidence labs allow us to have strong and robust visual evidence of a racialized response from the state. Having evidence also helps local organizations to, uh, to make their calls and their demands in their meetings with decision makers. We have this deep collaboration with researchers who are embedded in local communities. So by partnering with the regional office colleagues, we're able to understand which voices, for example, are most important to be heard. In late 2022, a number of videos had started to emerge of lines of young men being led up the mountainside and they were being led to their execution. I was using sun calculation tools to determine what time of day the video may have been filmed and matching geographic features to find exactly which mountainside uh, they had been filmed on. We were able to identify these victims and really reconstruct what happened on that mountainside in Panjshir. This is the thing that amnesty can do, is we know that local people that are experiencing these conflicts, they know things nobody else does. And so by building that long-term trust with local people, we are in a position to find and report those things. When we see dozens of people getting detained by a Taliban, that's not just something that we're going to retweet and say this shouldn't happen. That's something that we can build into a substantive human rights case that's presented on the international level to people who might be able to do something about it. In 2023, we continue to build our work on the specific ways that conflicts affect certain at-risk groups, including children, women, people with disabilities, and, and older people. In southern Turkey, buildings crumble like sand. We traveled to four provinces. We spoke to more than 130 people. One particular 85-year-old man told us that he had not been bathed in more than 25 days because of the difficulty of carrying him to a bathing facility. People with disabilities are not being adequately considered because of insufficient efforts to collect and analyze data segregated by age, by gender, and by disability. Now, this data is crucial because it ensures that people with disabilities are not invisible and that their needs and rights are being addressed. When we publish a report, that's often, that's often the beginning of, of a new part of our work. That work then focuses on advocacy. It's about building campaigns that help harness the amnesty movement and the power that that can bring in terms of influencing situations. So our aim in 2023 was to build capacity within the movement. More voices means more pressure. So we did a lot of training sessions. This year is a really pivotal year. Member states are meeting at the UN in May, where there's going to be a resolution on whether or not a convention can move forward. All of the work that we've done up to this point, all of the reports that we've done, all of the engagement with sections, that is now building towards this moment. Once our findings are, are there, it allows us really to, to have an impact and to harness the power of that amnesty name to bring about the most change possible in conflict areas around the world. Al Raj camp in northeast Syria is filled with desperate families that nobody wants. In 2024, we'll be releasing a report about the arbitrary detention of tens of thousands of men, women and children because of their perceived affiliation with ISIS. There is one prison called Sini camp where they were being denied 
food, water, uh, medicine, and health care. And that was causing people to die in the hundreds. And they were dying horrible deaths, preventable deaths. And this was in a prison that has been specifically supported by the U.S. What we've learned and what we're going to demonstrate with this report is just how far that involvement goes. So when we started 2023, we wanted to work in a way that would ensure full participation of the people affected. So we spent a lot of time and effort making sure that the LGBTI refugees in Kakuma themselves shaped our project. Once you develop a relationship on a long-term basis, people trust you to be able to share some of the challenges they're facing, trust you as an ally that you will work with them to bring changes. But also the community feel like they are part of the process in terms of development of the solutions that they feel is better for them. In partnership with refugee-led organizations, we organize the training so that when the situation of refugees in their country is discussed, they are also at the table so that they can tell everybody these are our priorities and our issues. After publishing our report, we continued the advocacy with meetings to make sure that our recommendations are followed up too and that the legislation in Lithuania changes. When we started our work, there were about 4,000 people that had been detained. Today, only 38 people are still detained in Lithuania. It's a project that has got repercussions at the European level and also at the international level. Twenty twenty three was a great year for community sponsorship because the United States decided to start. Up to five thousand refugees were resettled in twenty twenty four is planned to be ten thousand. I was talking to a colleague yesterday in the States who was telling me about how a connection they made with a colleague from Australia has been a really important development for them as they work to scale up their program in the United States to look at learning uh, from Australia on how to mobilize and engage communities as effectively as possible. So the impact of the event goes way beyond the few days that we have together. It, it, it really has a deep, deep systemic impact. The community sponsorship work is creating networks and creating communities that is the best of humanity coming out on both sides. Five years into Be There, we are able to build really strong cases that show the violations that are being committed against civilians and what needs to be done to address them. We've been working on U.S. operations and how they do civilian harm for years and years. Somalia, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and because of the long-term advocacy that we've done, the Biden administration has made a whole number of changes to the civilian harm guidance. These are really major, major changes, and many are long-term amnesty recommendations. We have incredible clout because we provide consistent evidence that holds up over time. Because of that long-term legitimacy and that steady voice, that's really how we've been able to make change. Because we have the combination of high quality evidence that cannot be disputed and the ability to mobilize over 10 million to support global campaigns, we can influence international law and the conduct of those who hold power. That's what makes us unique. That is what makes us distinct. That is what makes us powerful force to achieve the human rights impact that can deliver change 